Tucker is not an independent actor in Moscow because when you see that um, supermarket, for instance, and you say, oh, how amazing everyone lives. Look at these uh, subways. I did something that I mistakenly the other day when I was reading up again on the apartment bombings. I went back to this because I was just thinking about this with Tucker and conspiracy theories. And I think it's Raison was the name of the town that's just southeast of Moscow. So I looked at mm -hmm. the apartment buildings on Google Maps. And then I did Google Street View in this town. It, it literally looks like nothing has changed since the 1960s. It's a Soviet mm -hmm. dump. And I apologies to anyone who's listening who lives there, but I'll tell you what, it does not look modern. It does not look post-Soviet. It looks pre-Soviet in so many ways. And everyone looks grim and miserable. And this is the stuff that Tucker is not going to see because when you try to go and say, I'm going to go visit, um, you know, Memorial, the, the dissident group that's been shut down by Putin, by the way. And what did Memorial do? Incidentally, this is not about Putin. They um, were, uh, organization that did incredible archival work of people that were killed in the gulag and killed by the soviet union killed by stalin and it's an incredible organization M memorial was shut down because the past has to be controlled too not just the present and if you went to see somebody like that if you were tucker carlson you wouldn't last very long they would make it very very clear that that was not allowed or they would interfere with it in some way so you're not you know on your own i mean when i was in russia i had to get a visa through the government. And that requires yeah. a lot of very specific stuff. The other thing, I mean, I, I've made this point in a few different places and for whatever reason, people continue to not really grok it. Um, but like, you know, I was recently in Bucharest, Romania, and you know, you get a car and you venture outside of sort of main city yes. corridor. Okay. Suddenly it feels like the shitty Romanian rust belt, right? It's like so boring, I'm literally, yeah. I was like breastfeeding my child on the side of the road in rural Romania. And there's just these like almost like zombie apocalypse looking people with like clearly haven't had dental care in the last two decades or whatever. Like mm -hmm. literally since Ceausescu was in power, like they haven't had, you know, brushed their teeth. And I'm just sort of looking and it's like, well, I've seen a lot of different forms of poverty around the world, but like if you just came to Bucharest and you just saw the, you know, film production crews uh, and went to some of the nice restaurants, then went to that like cool cocktail bar down there, you would have no clue that None. this type of Correct. thing is happening an hour away. And yeah. that's not just Romania, right? Like it's a gazillion, um, you know, shithole countries or formerly shithole, formerly communist countries that are like that. Uh, yeah. And that's just the side of it that I really wish people would pay some yeah, you know, amount I mean, of attention I, to. I spent like four days in St. Petersburg, Russia on vacation. Um, so, you know, probably not that much less time than Tucker spent in Moscow. And but just in that amount of period of time, and I, I was just there, you know, to, to see things, you notice right away that there's a lot of it's like there's these this really grand architecture, but like you get close to stuff and it looks kind of dingy. And then like, yes, driving back just to the airport, you just see like desolation. Um, so it just raises the question to me of, you know, it's almost cartoonish the way that he put together these shorts. Like it's over the like the style, the editing. Well, well, let's play the subway one because I just want to comment on like the way this is. The music, the score is, is incredible. Bizarre. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, Ian, roll the subway clip for us. <laughs> One of the ways you understand a society is through its infrastructure, the places where people gather, the places where they go to travel. If you've got a lot of people in one place, it tells you a lot about the people. So with that in mind, we're standing in front of the Kievskaya metro station and there's a train station next to it. Now, the metro station was built by Joseph Stalin 70 years ago. And the question is, how's it doing now? There's no graffiti, there's no filth, there are no foul smells. There are no bums or drug addicts or rapists or people waiting to push you onto the train tracks and kill you. No, it's perfectly clean and orderly. And how do you explain that? We're not even going to guess. That's not our job. We're only gonna ask the question. And if your response is to shout at us slogans dumber than the slogans we used to call Soviet and mock, that's not really an answer. <laughs> Moment 
Like, what the hell is going on the here? The hills are alive with the sound <laughs> of communism. Um, I, you notice, by the way, uh, he did Soviet in air quotes, which is pretty funny for somebody who is a... And, uh, a by the way, that montage ends on a shot of like a portrait of Lenin. So Yes, yeah, there's a, there's a, <laughs> yeah. a relief of Lenin in there. But also, you might have noticed the name Kiev is in the, in the name of the station. And there is a, a plaque beneath Lenin, which is that final shot in that, which is about the eternal friendship between the Ukrainian and uh, Russian people. Um, and I imagine that that was on purpose. I'm not entirely sure if that was a little Easter egg, but you, you look at all these other images, which are classic constructivist Russian images of lantern jawed men with flags. And you know, that, that was a, the subway that was built with slave labor, people from the Gulag. I mean, yeah. that's not a, even disputed. But I mean, like, can you break and this with... down for us, uh, Michael? Cause I mean, you, you know, you and Liz are, are in New York city, the subway mm -hmm. can be pretty shitty. So yeah, like, why sure. does Moscow have like this beautiful artwork and New York city doesn't? I mean, well, we didn't have Joseph Stalin, that's for sure. We did yeah. have the like WPA and these uh, public works projects, which actually tried to create, um, socialist art in New York City, and it became very, very controversial. You go back to the, the 1930s during the uh, New Deal that these, um, you know, Diego Rivera creating this big, uh, you know, communist memorial um, uh, in, in the middle of New York City and people objecting to it. But the reason this happens is dictatorships can create things like that. Yes. Yeah, sure. It's, I mean, l let's be honest about it. North you Korea has less crime problem. than New York City. Do you want to live in yeah, North I Korea mean, or do you want to live in New York in, City? In these types of places, you can round up bumps, right? Like you can just do all kinds of things them far outside of the law, right? Like to yes. some degree, I want to, you know, I am frequently, you know, a critic of NYPD and I think, you know, most libertarians are. There's absolutely situations where they are use uh, excessive force on um, all kinds of people doing things uh, that, you know, we might dispute whether or not they should be considered crimes, right? Like mm. NYPD definitely errs in some ways, but by and large, they're not like rounding up bums and putting them in trucks and imprisoning them for a really long time or sending them to like forced no. labor camps or like, like that's not how bums and junkies are disposed of in New York. In fact, a, a big part of the criticism is that they're not really disposed of at all, right? Like we had this big push to do away with institutionalization. And to some degree, you know, we could kind of trace some of our current predicament to that, right? Like, and I, you know, maybe lots of New Yorkers are not comfortable with those trade-offs, but these are trade-offs either way you slice it, right? It's yeah, either the, yeah, public despair or private despair, but it's not like you're doing away with despair altogether, I don't think. Yeah, there's no Thomas Saz in, in Russia, I don't think. <laughs> but the, the, the interesting thing about this is what he's essentially saying, I mean, but he's not saying in so many words because it's kind of, you know, camouflaged in so many ways, is that this isn't, a, this isn't a policy thing, right? I mean, even if this were true, it is not true. There's an enormous amount of crime in Russia. There's an enormous amount of poverty in Russia. There's homelessness in Russia. There, you know, at the last phase of the Soviet Union- There's alcoholism in Russia, by the way, that, also. Like, so, so that was the- passed out in the middle. That was the big public works uh, thing in, in 1985 and 86 when Gorbachev took over. It was like, it was an anti-alcohol campaign because alcoholism was so bad and, and alcohol was so cheap. It's the only thing you could get plentifully in the Soviet Union. So there's a lot of that, but why isn't it um, apparent right there? Well, I mean, you are you talking about the Putin regime? You're talking about the Russian character? I mean, because it all exists. Why do you not see it in the subway? Well, it's a police state. Uh, number one. Number two, you know, imagine what would happen if this news story, which got a lot of press in New York City, of this, um, these two NYPD cops that were set upon by a bunch of migrants, right? And they were arrested and no bail. They were released and then a bunch of them committed more crimes. Imagine something like that happening in Russia. Obviously, it wouldn't. And I can hear the Tuckers of the world saying, well, it shouldn't happen here. Yes, they shouldn't happen here. But the, the sort of tweaks around the edges of what could make city life better is not, the answer to that is not to have all power in the state. I don't understand yeah. people who are quote unquote conservatives or libertarians especially, believing that the way the state controls everything in Russia is something to be uh, applauded or emulated. I'll give you one example of this. I, when I was in Russia, I was uh, with Vitalik Buterin, the guy who created Ethereum. <laughs> And he was, and he's a Russian, he speaks Russian perfectly, uh, met with Putin actually the day before I met him and was denouncing Putin yesterday. This is somebody who uh, doesn't care. He has family there. His uh, parents moved after the fall of the Soviet Union to Canada. But when I was with him, we went to a, um, it was a technology park, I guess is what you call it, outside of Moscow. And I was talking to the guy who was like, you know, our handler. And he's like, this is our competition with Silicon Valley. 
And at one point I asked him, I was like, do you realize that you've done, the government has done this and you guys have a very poor record of the government creating big technology projects like we have in the United States. The Silicon Valley was created by some people like Sergey Brin, Russians <laughs> who were allowed through the magic of, of the free market to create it. And they were still doing this. They were still trying to create in a centrally planned way. It's not a communist country, but it's still that central planning instinct. And like, is this the country that people like Tucker Carlson want to live in? Good God, I would, yeah, I would escape immediately. Yeah. Hey, thanks for watching that clip from our new show, Just Asking Questions. You can watch another clip here or the full episode here. New episodes drop every week. So subscribe to Reason TV's YouTube channel to get notified when that happens or to the Just Asking Questions podcast on Apple, Spotify, or any other podcatcher. See you next week.